Turn us off. This virus is all your fault. No one wants to sit near you. Get away, she may be from China. You're from an Asian family, you might have it. You shouldn't be here. Why don't you just go back to where you came from? Kung flu, Chinese virus. I'm scared for myself. I'm afraid for my family. I'm afraid to go back to school. Unfortunately, this is all too real for so many Asian American youth around the country uh, where I've heard from friends and family that they too are afraid to go back to school, go to work, show themselves in public. And it shouldn't be this way. I remember when I was growing up in upstate New York, uh, before anyone had ever heard of the coronavirus, it was still difficult where I was called uh, various racial epithets uh, semi-regularly. And I can only imagine how that cruelty would surge at a time when you have this pandemic that people mistakenly attribute to people of Asian descent. It's heartbreaking, it's devastating, but it's incredibly inspiring and invigorating that people are coming together here today to do something about it for the people that in my mind are among the most vulnerable in our community, which is middle schoolers and school children. So today we're going to be investing in the social and emotional learning of our children uh, of Asian American descent and otherwise so that we can start bringing these communities together and my campaign talked about math. I believe social emotional learning is so vital. I'm the parent myself of two young boys uh, and we need to be investing in these types of, uh, of skills for young people to understand what's happening to them inside of their own minds. So the Stand Up for AAPI Youth program is something to be proud of for our community that we're standing up and saying our kids deserve better we need to give them better and that our educators want to help and that if we invest in these school school based programs, we can make an enormous difference for the next generation of Asian American kids coming of age so that they don't feel afraid to go to school. They don't feel like they're American. This is in question. They feel like they're at home as they should in their own classroom in their own school. Thrilled to be here today. Thrilled to hopefully help combat this hatred that is overrunning far too many of our communities. And I'm very happy to introduce right now a video from my friend, Kamala Harris, who's the vice presidential nominee. In my view, she's going to be our next vice president. Uh, she represents a real high watermark for Asian Americans around the country, showing that we can aspire to the highest offices in the land and we can lead and contribute in this country at the highest possible levels. So my friend, Vice Presidential Nominee of the Democratic Party, Kamala Harris. Hey everyone, it's Kamala. And as always, I am so proud to support and stand beyond differences and the partnership with the Community Center of San Francisco in standing up for our AAPI youth and their families. In this moment where there's so many powerful forces trying to sow hate and division and engage in xenophobic rhetoric, we know the strength of unity. We know the strength of lifting up our young leaders and doing everything we can to support them and their families. So let's keep doing it. This is about the vision of the America that we know we are. And we're gonna support our AAPI youth all the way. Thank you. Hi, I'm Hudson Yang. Uh, I played Eddie Huang on ABC's Fresh Out the Boat for the last six years. So on the show as a middle schooler, my character endured, endured a lot of AAPI stereotypes. The good news there was that it provided teaching opportunities to both my character, his classmates, neighbors, and even his principal who often made generalizations about Chinese and Asian people. Luckily that was all scripted, but today I'm upset to see the hate and attacks on my fellow AAPI teens and adults in real life. And I want to do something about it. I'm doing my best put myself out there, joining different activism, activisms. Uh, I'm on the board for a, a, community, a group called Act to Change. And I've been trying to do my best to speak out against bullying and hate that's been going on around the world today. Um, and also just using my platform and my voice from being you know, an AAPI youth in Hollywood to spread the word and spread you know, our culture. And so 
right now, I think it's most important to actually educate people, especially students, about the cultural differences and importance of just, you know, speaking out against racism and bullying. And that's one of the main reasons why I didn't hesitate to work with this group to help bring awareness to racism against API and practically just everyone uh, due to COVID. And, you know, speaking of education, uh, I thought it was also important that I got here. So I got permission and got excused from my high school classes to speak out. And I'm really glad that Tony Th uh, Thurman, the California State Superintendent of Public Instruction, here to vouch for me and talk further about this important program to make schools more welcoming for API youth. So now I'd like to turn this over to T Tony Thurman. Uh, thank you, Hudson. And yes, I'm happy to vouch for you. If you need a note, I'd be happy to send it to your school. Um, thank you for using your voice and your celebrity uh, to make a difference. That, that makes you a star, and I'm grateful for what you're doing. Thank you. I'm, I'm grateful to have this opportunity to add my voice to the team leaders today um, who you'll hear from, from Beyond Differences and from uh, the Community Youth Centers in San Francisco. Uh, thank you for creating this opportunity um, to kick off what is really a national campaign about knowing your classmates, but also this most important uh, message where we are standing up for Asian American Pacific Islander students during this time during COVID. Our nation needs healing. If you look in the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd, our nation is just gripped by racial injustice and pain. And unfortunately, that has been exacerbated by leaders at the federal level who've chosen mistakenly to identify the coronavirus with any one country and you know, with China and to create really stereotypes and backlash against Asian American Pacific Islander people. You know, let us set the record straight. No one is responsible for the coronavirus and we are all impacted by it. And I'm sorry that any of our AAPI students have had to deal with bullying or name calling or stereotyping. We need to send the message to the president and to others that we need to stand together and we're standing up together for our AAPI students because we are all one community. Our differences make us special, but when we come together, uh, we are a stronger group of people who can do more together. Let's face it, school is tough enough as it is. There's so much bullying and, and difficult times. I mean, I don't know anything. We're gonna hear from the team leaders today and they're gonna tell us, but we don't need to have anybody putting, putting out hate that separates us. We need folks to bring us together. So I'm grateful for all the work that all of you are doing. I'm so proud of our students. Um, and yeah, I wanna send a note to all your schools and tell them how great leaders you are and how I'm thankful to be working with you um, today. I wanted to share one last thing. You know, California has such rich diversity. I'm so proud of it. We've worked with many members of our legislative um, API caucus in, in Sacramento. They came together to help us. We, we're, we did a series just a few weeks ago on ethnic studies. And the reason I bring that up is because as we talked about the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd, many of our students said, we wanna see positive representations of us in our history books. And so we put together a four part series, to talk about the contributions of Asian American and Pacific Islanders to help make California great. The experience of African Americans and Latinos and Native Americans to make California great. And so we're busy working now to build a curricula that will help schools figure out how to teach ethnic studies and to continue to place this great emphasis on all the contributions of so many and especially the contributions of our Asian American Pacific Islander students and their ancestors. And so we're proud of you, all of you in the AAPI community, and we're proud of all of our young people. Let us come together now and let us do great work together to, to push back on bullying, to make sure that we're all supported because as we deal with this pandemic, we can do more together, but we've got to stay together and work together. So thank you for today. Uh, I'm happy to turn the mic over to an incredible leader who needs no introduction. She's a friend and colleague who's been providing incredible leadership during this pandemic and for an incredible city. And that's none other than my good friend and colleague, Mayor London Bree. Thank you so much, uh, Superintendent Thurman, for your introduction and for the work that you do for our kids all over the state. It's my honor to really join two absolutely incredible organizations beyond differences and CYC in standing in solidarity with our Asian American community to launch this program to combat racism against our Asian American and Pacific Islander 
folks who are a part, an important part of this state and of this country. I, I really want to acknowledge Sarah Wan for uh, 50 years, uh, the 50 year anniversary of CYC and Laura Thomas, uh, the co-founder of Beyond Differences. Thank you both so much for being incredible leaders in this fight against xenophobia and in this fight to protect young people all over the state. Uh, the fact is, it's important for us to come together. Uh, um, but also, I just really want to take the moment to appreciate the young people who are leading the way, the people who are part of this forum, uh, leading the way in combating hatred and, and spreading a message of love and inclusion. And it does start when you are children. I remember when I was in elementary school at Raffi Will, which is now called Rosa Parks Elementary School in San Francisco. And I was one of those very talkative kids. But I also believed in fairness and treating everyone with respect. And we, uh, and, and because I was a very talkative kid in school, my teacher made me a conflict manager. So my job was to go around in the school and deal with conflicts and deal with challenges. And our school had a lot of African Americans and a lot of Chinese Americans. And there, there was a disconnect between the cultures. And you know how children are, they're very honest, but more importantly, uh, there were a lot of comments uh, that were made about one another. And one of the things that I was very happy about, I remember this conflict uh, between one of my friends, uh, Kitty Ng and Sharonda, where they basically, we sat down and had an ominous conversation about our differences. And the fact is, we became friends and we shared one another's culture and we treated one another with respect. And I think that's what's so important, to come to the table, to have the conversations, and to not treat people the way that we all don't want to be treated. And it starts when you're a kid. It takes a lot of bravery to share these experiences that many of you have had. And I know that many of them have been hurtful. I've had those hurtful words as a woman, and especially as an African-American woman said to me, and it doesn't feel good. We have to report uh, racial discrimination, particularly everything that's going on since this COVID-19 pandemic began. I have heard numerous stories from our Asian American community, but we are not reporting these incidents. And I do think it's important that we report them and we as city leaders do a better job to make sure that we are putting messages out there that unite our communities and not continue to tear us apart. Our Asian American and Pacific Islander communities sadly have faced this xenophobia and discrimination in general, but it has gotten worse since the coronavirus has hit with reports of people avoiding Chinatown. And this happened at the very beginning of this year and even late last year, the hateful graffiti, the flyers, and even an assault on one of our muni drivers. There is no place for this type of behavior in San Francisco. We are a city that prides itself on our diversity and inclusion. And with a federal administration that attacks our immigrant and Asian American community every day, it's so important that kids do not think that the leader of this country is the example for how we should behave and how we should treat each other. It's important that we stand up for one another. And I'm really proud, as I said, of the young folks who are a part of this call, a part of this movement, uh, this is why I'm so grateful for this partnership and the work that you all continue to do. My office, including my education advisor and school board commissioner, Jenny Lamb, is committed to working with these incredible organizations to support this program. Because when we look beyond our differences, we're able to see what we have in common. We're able to share our cultures and our experiences and our lives and, and everything that that entails. And that's what makes us a great city and a great country. These days, it's so much more important than ever. We have to join the fight to fight against the forces of hate. Thank you again for having me. And I look forward to our continued work together. Before I log off, it's really my honor to introduce my friend who represents us in Sacramento. He is an incredible leader for our city and also in the Chinese community who has been working to combat xenophobia from the very beginning. Ladies and gentlemen, I wanna turn it over to Assemblymember David Chu. Thank you, Mayor Breed. Good morning.
morning, everyone. Uh, let me just first take a moment to just acknowledge how many incredible people are part of this gathering today. I, I look out onto the Zoom and I see so many friends and allies from across the country who are doing just amazing work. And of course, I wanna echo the thanks to Laura Thomas from Beyond Differences, Sarah Wan and Eddie Zhang from CYC, uh, my great friend and former colleague, Tony Thurman, uh, my longtime friend, London Breed, the mayor of San Francisco, and so on and so on. But let me also say, this is about the next generation. Uh, all of the folks who may hold positions at this moment, we're not going to hold them forever. And we're looking, I think, at the next generation of leaders, and it is all of you who, who are part of this. And uh, I just have to say, because Hudson Yang is the son of one of my oldest friends, um, it is our kids. It is our kids' friends. You guys are the ones who are going to take over the world and make it a better place to fix the things that we're not able to fix just quite yet. So, um, you know, a lot has already been said, and I know a lot is going to be said about the impact of racism and this virus of racism during this pandemic. Let me just say that when the pandemic started, before a single case was documented in the United States, I was in touch with Asian American elected colleagues from around the country. And I see Yuli Neo from New York, who represents Manhattan's Chinatown, my good friend Michelle Wu, who represents Boston Chinatown. I think I saw Sharon Tomiko Santos, who represents uh, the state of Washington. We were all trading stories about the fact that before a single virus was reported in our country, our Chinatowns, our Japan towns, our Asian neighborhoods, our Asian communities were being decimated by racism because people didn't want to go into those communities based on fear uh, that was completely unfounded. Um, and as a chair of the California API Legislative Caucus, our caucus joined with a number of civil rights organizations in our state to launch an online anti-hate reporting center to track anti-Asian hate incidents. And I think some of you know, uh, this center has tracked over 2,300 incidents and over a third of those, eight to 900, were documented in the great state, the great progressive state of California. And we know that these are numbers that are just tips of the iceberg, that so many incidents have been unreported or not documented to this reporting center. At the same time, we have a so-called president and his political allies who relish in adding fuel to the fire by talking about Kung flu or the Chinese virus, despite the fact that they know the direct causal relationship between being racist and racist incidents. And we also know that racism against all of our communities, but including against our Asian communities, is nothing new. The Chinese Exclusion Act, the Japanese American internment, what happened to our Muslim brothers and sisters after 9-11, the murder of Vincent Chen. These are the markers of our community. And I know Mayor Breed and others have shared their personal story, but I will tell you, if I could count on my if I could count how many times I was called a chink growing up. I actually have enough to fuel my next reelection campaign. And, uh, and the fact of the matter is my high school classmates called everyone all sorts of horrible things. This is a work in progress. America is a work in progress. But we know that change will happen with every new generation and it has to happen. Uh, at a time when we're combating not just the virus of COVID-19, but the virus of racism, um, as our schools start to open, reopen, we know that one of the significant challenges we're facing is how all the things from our generation are impacting the next generation and how important it is for all of us to ready and prepare and really we put our trust in you, the next generation, to help lift ourselves, lift all of us up. A couple of years ago, when Tony Thurman was my colleague in the state legislature, I authored a bill, and I was really excited to have his support, to address school bullying. And we introduced it in part because we saw bullying after Donald Trump was elected rise in every community, whether you were an African-American student, an LGBTQ student, an immigrant student. We saw over half of Muslim students in 2017, 2018, who reported an experience of bullying or harassment. Literally, fifth grade boys beaten on the playground, uh, girls with hijabs ripped off their heads. And this is just in the last couple of years. We have a lot of work to do. We need our schools to be safe. We need environments around our young people to be safe. And as a parent of a four-year-old, this has to happen, and it has to happen on all of our watch. And so I just want to say how committed I am and all of us are to this fight. 
um, we will we will turn the corner on the pandemic and on the recession, and we will turn the corner on the racism if we're all working together. So just thank you for everything you're doing. And with that, uh, I am delighted to welcome uh, my great San Francisco colleague, Assemblymember Phil Ting. Thanks, David. Really appreciate uh, your comments, and it's great to join you as well as Mayor Breed, uh, Superintendent Thurman, so many other friends today. And thank you so much to CYC and Beyond Differences for bringing us together. I know so often that young people, they feel isolated, they feel alone. Uh, and that's how people win. When we have uh, groups of people bullying us and attacking us, they want us to feel like we are alone, that we are by ourselves. And this meeting, this uh, virtual gathering just is a reminder that we are not by ourselves. That in fact, there's a lot more of us than there are them and that we don't have ownership over racism or poverty or so many of the issues that we feel in our life. And quite often, those feelings manifest themselves in uh, you know, potentially destructive ways, especially with young people. And what we so often need are more groups like CYC and Beyond Differences to, to bring us together, to share those personal stories, because everybody has a personal story. Everybody is overcoming some particular struggle at any particular time. And no one's, no one's struggle is worse or better than anybody else's. And that's, that's what we have to hear. We have to hear that from each other and really have the opportunity, the space to really respect each other's stories. So often it becomes a competitive process of whose story is more, uh, more, more worse, that's not a really right way to say it, but you know, whose story is worse than somebody else's. And that's, that's the wrong way to look at it. We have to look at it as human beings and really how we can better understand each other. We don't wanna look at it in terms of who faces more racism, who faces all these different isms in our society. Uh, we all face our different challenges. Uh, my colleague David Chu just articulated many of the things that more recently Asian Americans have faced because so many people who, who look like me are being blamed for uh, COVID and bringing COVID into this country and bringing COVID all around the world, which is absolutely not true. Uh, and we see that impact in terms of a huge uptick in hate and frankly in violence um, going on across this country. And while we think maybe we're safe in a beautiful place like San Francisco because we're so progressive and so tolerant. We have so many incidents that have been reported directly in San Francisco that they'd be shocking. Uh, and so the best place to start is really with young people and young people have open minds. Young people are willing to be more open and more honest and it's really the best time in the world to share. I, I really uh, again want to thank the superintendent for his leadership on our ethnic studies requirement. I know that that's been a significant challenge, but so oftentimes when young people don't hear their stories in their curriculum, they don't know where they fit. We don't know, we don't think we belong in this country, which is absolutely wrong. Uh, and so we want a curriculum that really reflects the fabric of California, the fabric of San Francisco. And ethnic studies is just one very small step for us to not feel isolated, to not feel alone, to make sure that our stories are valued, our histories are valued, our families are valued. Um, and so for me, you know, this gathering is so important because it's really about us. Us is so much larger than them. And to us, I am so proud to be uh, with all of us standing together and just recognizing that we're all just human beings trying to do what's best for our families, our loved ones, our communities, and that there's a lot more of us than them. Uh, lastly, uh, I, I wanted to make a special announcement because every year our assembly districts um, get to choose a nonprofit of the year. And I couldn't be more proud than to announce that I am uh, choosing CYC as our nonprofit of the year for assembly district 19. Um, you know, I think it goes without saying for organizing uh, press conferences like this, but just their tireless 
effort in our community, really uh, working with young people, inspiring young people. They've been a wonderful partner in our Autumn Moon Festival. Uh, uh, they run the after school program at my daughter's school, as well as many other schools across the city. And, and but just their, their positive influence in our community. And they are so much about community and bringing people together, not about driving people apart. And so I just wanted to just thank CYC Thanks, Sarah, for her incredible leadership uh, and just announced that they're going to be the Assembly District 19's Nonprofit of the Year. Uh, I also just, again, just want to thank Laura and her Beyond Differences team for everything uh, they've been doing, not just uh, in San Francisco, but all across the state. Um, your message of you know, coming together, we need to be coming together as communities is so powerful, so needed right now when we are all feeling uh, more isolated than ever. So thank you to both of you for uh, organizing this today. I am so proud to introduce uh, New York State Assembly member Yulene New, uh, who's just been an amazing advocate in New York on uh, issues of uh, anti-Asian violence and hate. So uh, Assembly member, take it away. Hello, everyone. Um, everyone's so smooth talking. I'm like just not that so i'm just gonna <laughs> i'm gonna go and be myself but um my name's yuleen i'm actually the uh, new york state assembly member that represents lower manhattan and that encompasses the chinatown of uh, new york city the oldest chinatown but also um uh one that was hit very very hard during this um this pandemic um because of xenophobia and racism and i just want to thank all of the folks who came out to speak um about this amazing program introduced by beyond differences and CI cyc uh currently in new york i am in the new york state legislature the only asian american woman um and i'm also the only asian american person to hold my assembly seat even though chinatown is part of the district um, I am only one of four Asian American elected officials in the entire New York State Legislature. Uh, Asian Americans, even though we uh, <laughs> are very comparable in, um, you know, California's population of Asian Americans, we have we have like more than 13% of our state's population uh, Asian American, and yet we have less than 2% uh, of the representation. So it's a pretty significant. Uh, you know, pretty significant thing to say that we need more representation here because when we don't have that representation at the table, it also makes it so, oh, little known fact, um, Asian Americans were never even once mentioned in our state's budget until I was elected. <laughs> so, um, you know, these are the things that start to take away from our communities, right? L lack of language access, lack of, tra lack of transparency, lack of um, accessibility. And I think that, uh, you know, having, um, you know, this amazing uh, group of young people stand up for AAPI youth program. It's an essential uh, step in bridging that divide uh, through accessible and necessary education. And I think that folks don't understand that, um, you know, it's so important to have these diverse uh, perspectives uh, at every table. And so to be able to make change, we need to have knowledge behind why something is happening and stand up gives teachers the resources and accessibility that they need to bring this knowledge um, to their classroom. And I just want to say thank you to um, the mayor who spoke earlier, uh, because you know what she was saying was so so true, so true. Because um, Asian Americans underreport a lot all the time, and so a lot of the uh, you know the targeted crimes that are happening to Asian Americans uh, goes unreported and um, undocumented. And so it's necessary for us to be able to have those clear, difficult conversations within our community. I think it's necessary to understand things like the model minority myth, which is very, very present um, in my district and, uh, and also in the lesson plan for stand up. And so I think that, you know, even though Asian Americans have been marginalized, erased from our history, American history, um, throughout history, and oftentimes unfairly persecuted, for example, um, as David was mentioning with the Chinese Exclusion Act and Japanese internment camps in World War II, while Asian Americans um, settled in different areas around the country, um, like Chinatown in my district, and we made our home a vibrant and cultural center in many different uh, cities, um, there's still a major lack of these necessary resources, social services, and accessibility for our community. Um, and because of you know, the model minority myth, it is often perceived that Asian Americans in general are overall successful, right? Um, and, but in reality, I wanna just put this out there, in New York City, one in four Asian Americans lives in poverty. We are in fact, the, have the highest rate of poverty in any racial or ethnic group. 
let that sink in. And that misconception um, that is driven by the stereotype means that Asian Americans are overlooked when it comes to resources. Aggregated data that puts Asian Americans as one group, one monolithic group, prevents the resources needed in our specific AAPI communities from being addressed or distributed. It also prevents language access, which is so key to even accessing these basic resources. Having these sorts of lessons taught in the stand-up program means that our young people can be aware of these stereotypes and work to change them as they are making their way in the world. And I just wanna thank all of you for working on this because it is so critical. And I wanna thank Hudson. I wanna thank all of these young people who have spoken up because it is, it is um, part of my own personal story that I was bullied in school. So a lot of folks um, think that it is so, um, so simple uh, that I live in New York City, that it's so diverse, etc. But I actually grew up in El Paso, Texas. Um, my parents, when they first moved to America, when they first immigrated here, they actually, um, you know, picked out of all the cities in the world, Moscow, Idaho <laughs> to move to. And so it was just like, there's, there's uh, significant cultural shifts, cultural differences. And, um, you know, I, when I was in the classroom, uh, I still remember um, there was this one girl and she just, told, I, I grew up thinking I was very ugly that I um, had strange hair, small eyes, big mouth, and that I was, um, you know, just a lot of bad things, right? And so she pulled me into the coat closet, and this is in first grade. Remember, we are like seven years old. She pulled me into the coat closet and um, had all of my classmates take turns spitting on me. And then, um, you know, she threw my lunchbox into the boys' bathroom once, and um, then set the trash can on fire and then tried to set me on fire um, and then it set off the school alarm and um, and uh, I peed myself in a bathroom um, because you know these are things that uh, happen to children uh, and it's taught to them right it's not something that uh, you know they just are born with it's it's taught to them and so we can teach differently and we can teach each other. And I think that this is something that is so uh, amazing. And I just wanna say that it's so incredible that these are the young people who are stepping up and doing this change. And that way nobody ever has to go through that again. So thank you so much to all of your bravery. Thank you so much to all the things that you are um, doing. And I just wanted to introduce somebody who really helped me um, as a young person in Washington state where I was actually a legislative intern for the first time. Um, my mom, as I call her, Sharon Tomiko Santos, who's a representative, one of the first um, Asian American state representatives ever, um, her, her leadership, was one that I looked up to as a young person. And um, her mentorship is one that helped me to thrive. Um, this is a person who uh, I can't speak highly enough of because when I first went for my very first interview, and this is why mentorship is so important, she was willing to sit with me and talk me through my resume, go line by line through it. We ate steak and ketchup, I still remember. And she, at the end of it, asked me, um, you know, what are you gonna wear? <laughs> and I, of course, as somebody who was very low income, um, didn't have much to wear. And so she went into her own closet and pulled out clothes for me to wear. So this is my mom, Sharon Tomiko Santos, representative in Washington State. Oh, thank you. You need to know how proud I am of you and all of the things that you are working for. Good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for this opportunity to join you. As a lifelong advocate for providing quality public education programs, including for our early learners and for closing the educational opportunity gap, I was so, so excited to learn about Stand Up for AAPI Youth and so proud and privileged to be invited to join you today. This program not only brings up questions like, do I belong for a discussion, but also examines exclusionary behaviors and how they impact us. This question is very, very real to me. As the daughter of someone who was incarcerated as a nine-year-old because of her race and the way she looked, my husband remembers wearing a big button as a child that stated, I am Filipino. We know that it's not only attitudes and behaviors that affect us on an interpersonal level, but these attitudes and behaviors are reflected in the government policies that are so that are adopted. These experiences taught me to believe in teaching empathy and compassion 
we are to reverse this public thinking and the action in our society. Stand up for AAPI use of topics like labeling, stereotypes, minority myths, and cultural appropriation, all subjects that need to be unpacked and explored in order to build common ground and acceptance. As the chair of the Washington State House Education Committee, I'm deeply proud that we have already adopted standards for social emotional learning like those that are continued in this program. I can't wait to introduce Stand Up for AAPI Youth to my state because I believe every school in my state and indeed throughout the country should benefit from adopting this program. Congratulations to you, California, to the organization that helped create this wonderful, wonderful program. You are taking the voices that have been suppressed for years, for decades, for generations, and you're bringing them to the fore. And now I feel hopeful because of you. I'd like to introduce next Sarah Wong, Executive Director of Community Youth Center San Francisco, my hometown, who represents one of the organizations responsible to create Stand Up for AAC. Thank you, Representative Santos. This year, CYC is celebrating our 50 years of service and commitment to our youth and families, while we are also facing unprecedented challenge. This COVID-19 pandemic has become another reason to target the AAPI communities all across the country. Um, according to Stop AAPI Hate, residents of San Francisco alone reported 94 incidents of COVID-19-related discrimination, with 30% reported by young people just in the first months of shelter in place. And with distance learning, our staff witnessed many of our AAPI youth dealing with fear, isolation, anxiety, depression, and other mental health symptoms. And yet it is always our hope to be able to turn the table around through education. And at CYC, we always strive to deepen young people's experience on racial justice and cross-cultural relationship building. So to this endeavor, thanks to my board chair, January Max introduction, we are so honored to partner with Beyond Differences to develop the STEM Up for AAPI Youth Curriculum, which centers around youth voices. The CYC Youth Leaders and Beyond Differences team board members were the driving force behind these activities and discussions that you will see featured in the newly revised Know Your Classmates curriculum that includes lessons on privilege, stereotypes, bias, the modern minority myth, representation, allyship, and so much more. And the core of the curriculum is to build empathy and connection between students. So during our work together with the Beyond Differences, it was so uplifting to see this firsthand on several occasions as the youth connected over their passion for social justice. And through this curriculum, our educators, Stephanie Wong Ha and Sally Kuman and youth leaders hope to bring more awareness about the hate and discrimination that the AAPI community faces by amplifying the AAPI youth voice and experience. And learning about this issue is just the first step in creating change. In educating students across the nation, we hope to create a world where people are more aware of their privilege and bias in order to practice better allyship. We are calling on every school to adopt this program so that not only AAPI students, but all students, including Black, Indigenous, and people of color, feel safe, accepted, and included. And this, I would like to welcome my greatest partner in creating Stand Up for AAPI Youth Curriculum, Laura Thomas, founder and executive director of Beyond Differences. Thank you, Sarah. I am so proud to be here today, and I stand here or sit here, if you will, at my kitchen table as executive director and co-founder, along with my husband, Ace Smith, of Beyond Differences. We are a nonprofit dedicated to ending social isolation and creating cultures of belonging for middle school students in particular. As a nation, we must stand up for our AAPI youth who are the target of an insidious campaign of hate. Our part is in the schools of America, and our message is simple. If you are an AAPI youth, we have your back. 
Your teachers have your back. And with our youth allies, your fellow students will have your back. We know how to do this. 10 years ago, we were founded in memory of our daughter, Lily Rachel Smith, who passed away at the age of 15 from medical complications associated with APERT syndrome, the cranial, cranial facial anomaly with which she was born. Lily was a happy, social, and smart little girl whose life drastically changed when she entered middle school. She felt ignored and disconnected from her classmates, even those with whom she had grown up through public schools. And probably the lowest moments of her day were lunchtime, when I would often receive calls at my office where she was hiding and crying in the girl's bathroom, begging me to come pick her up and take her home. Lily's life experience motivated her former classmates to come together and begin Beyond Differences, bringing our programs right back in middle school where it all began. Today, we are proud to have been the first organization in the country more than 10 years ago to recognize social isolation as a public health crisis for youth. And experts agree, the best time to begin addressing this is during middle school, when students are becoming more self-aware, looking for leadership opportunities, and still young enough to stand up and do the right thing. That is why we are a student-led movement. We put their voice and their ideas into everything we do. And we are probably best known for National No One Eats Alone Day, celebrated on Valentine's Day each year. In 2016, we created, with the Islamic Networks Group, Know Your Classmates to Combat Islamophobia. We modeled our program after President Obama's 2015 initiative called Know Your Neighbors, which was a coalition of multi-faith and civil rights organizations. Sadly, today, we are seeing the same rise in hate against our AAPI children, friends, and neighbors. We could not stand by and do nothing. We're not only a nonprofit that works to end social isolation in middle schools, but we are a social justice movement. And when we see injustice, we act. Stand Up for AAPI Youth is free to all schools and a valuable tool for teachers to discuss and engage students in difficult and critical conversations and exercises about race, religion, gender identity, family traditions, immigration, and much more. Our curriculum and student programs are now being used in more than 6,000 schools in all 50 states. Regardless of whether children live in a red state or a blue state, social isolation affects them all. Our country's dedicated teachers see its drastic and painful results every day, whether through distant learning or in the classrooms. So before I turn this over to our amazing teens to wrap up the event, I want to reiterate our national call to action. We are asking every school in America to bring Know Your Classmates to their schools this year, a free, fun, easy to use curriculum with student leadership activities, and to call on all students to take a pledge to stand up for their AAPI classmates. Go to beyonddifferences.org to sign up and bring the campaign to your school today. Thank you so much for being here today. What a thrilling morning. And now we'll hear from some of our amazing teen leaders from CYC and Beyond Differences about why they are standing up for their AAPI classmates. My name is Melissa and I'm here today to stand up for my AAPI classmates because we have to speak up for each other. My name is Sammy and I am here today to stand up for my AAPI classmates because we all deserve to be respected and accepted. My name is Georgia and I'm here today to stand up for my AAPI classmates because nobody deserves to have hate, rumors, and lies spread about them. My name is Michaela and I'm here today to stand up for my AAPI classmates because no one deserves to be pushed down for just being who they are. My name is Zoe and I'm here today to stand up for my AAPI classmates because it is my job to do my best to be an ally and to fight bias and hate wherever I see them. My name is Taylor and I'm here today to stand up for my AAPI classmates because everyone deserves to feel safe and valued at school.